for having us. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Dr. Ahmed Nasser, one of my partners uh, here at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, along with two of our excellent uh, fellows, Dr. Stephen Girdler and Dr. Matt Lindsay. Um, we're going to lead it off with the cases and just get right into it. Um, so I'm going to have uh, Dr. Girdler start off with the first case. Um, and today's focus is just going to be on kind of interesting and uh, some challenging cervical cases. Um, so Steve, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, can everyone hear me and see my screen? Great. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Stephen Girdler. I'm one of the spine surgery fellows at Mayo Clinic. So uh, I have a two cases and then um, my co-fellow, Dr. Matt Lindsay, uh, also has a few cases. So case one. So this is Katie. She's 65. She has three years of low back pain that radiates to her right leg and two to three months of hand numbness with progressive imbalance, difficulty to find motor skills. She has a past medical history significant for nicotine dependence, although she says she stopped smoking about 20 days ago. She has no relevant past surgical history. On physical examination, she has uh, four to five bilateral uh, upper extremity strength with three out of five in her grip and intrinsics. She also has decreased sensation in bilateral hands. Her lower extremities, she has uh, mild weakness approximately. Uh, she's also unable to tandem gait, has a positive Romberg, has a positive Hoffman, brisk upper extremity reflexes, and uh, ankle clonus bilaterally. So here are her lumbar MRIs. Uh, she has spinal stenosis, but we'll move past these. On her AP and uh, lateral x-rays, as well as flex and extension views, she has um, signs of uh, subaxial spinal stenosis, including uh, facet arthropathy. She has evidence of uh, congenital stenosis, no dynamic instability. And then again, here are her MRIs, and I have still images in just a second. So uh, here, here's uh, a few images of her MRIs. <clears throat> she has significant spinal stenosis, worse at C12 and then uh, at C45 and C67. Uh, CAT scan here demonstrates she has a large, uh, what the radiologist called pseudo subluxation, or looks to be extension of uh, right sided facet hypertrophy at C12, causing pretty significant spinal stenosis. So, this is the overview. Uh, of her imaging. Her main complaint is some leg pain, but she has very significant uh, myelopathy with these findings. So, so again, it. cervical myelopathy, uh, C12 compression, uh, and some subaxial stenosis, worse at C45 and C67. So uh, at this time, oh, let's see here. All right. Can you look, can you show us the, the lower ones besides the yeah. one? I can. Yeah. If you go back, there we go. Sorry about that. Kind of gave it away there. What were you asking to see? The C4, 5, and C6, 7, because C1, 2 is obviously quite significant. Um, the, the other ones just don't seem quite as bad. Sure, so there are some select cuts. I agree, definitely not as bad. Okay. So have you, has anyone never seen this type of sort of pseudo articulation before? I've, I've never come across it previously. Yeah, I don't think I have um, either origin. That's pretty, pretty impressive. No. Yeah, C12 is very impressive. And uh, it looks like along those lines, so people aren't as impressed with the lower levels. Uh, it sounds like um, would some folks here kind of consider just a C12 addressing that and leaving the rest of it alone? All day long. Yeah, I'm with Scott. And then along those lines, um, I know uh, Dr. Nasser, it looks like you're able to join us here. Um, do you think this is something that would be amenable to decompression alone, or is this someone you would think about fusing? Um, 
And if so, you know, what's your rationale there? Oh, maybe, uh, um, so maybe Dr. Nasser is having some trouble connecting with us. Uh, to the other panelists. Do you have the axial CT um, at the proximal level? Yeah, I don't know how you could do a decompression at that level without creating an unstable fusion situation at C12. I, I don't think there's any way around that. I think that's the worst cut right there. Got it. Yeah, I, I was curious if any of the neurosurgical colleagues would sort of just favor decompression. I, for me, this is, you know, something that I sort of uh, sort of agree. I, I don't know how I could do a decompression without sort of um, destabilizing that level. Um, but I was curious to see what the panelists would think. Um, and then in terms of counseling, um, you know, any specific conversations you have with the patient in terms of... Uh, risks of neurologic injury, C5 palsy, that type of thing. Yeah, I think the biggest thing would be, you know, reperfusion syndrome, like a white cord syndrome with that much compression at, at C12. That would be the biggest thing I'd counsel about. Did you guys debate about whether to do the, the lower levels too, as well, or is it just part of the part of the plan? Yeah, that, you know, that's a great question. I, I, I sort of went back and forth with this. Um, you know, if you had some mild uh, sort of radic symptoms, which, um, you know, I couldn't tell whether that was, you know, maybe potentially a C5 or C6 phenomenon. Um, certainly, obviously, the myelopathy, I think, is driven by that C1, too. Um, you know, in retrospect, maybe, you know, something limited at the C1, 2 level would have been, you know, all she needed. Um, but I sort of felt like, um, you know, I, I would hate it if she was still myelopathic afterwards or still had some residual symptoms, but yeah, I, I, I got it. And, and the way it looks like you address the subaxial spine is, is pretty neat, but it did, you know, prolong the operation in someone who's got a, you know, a hurt in spinal cord that uh, just wants to see the light of day. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very, um, it's a very fair uh, criticism. You know, I presented this case at our conference uh, uh, just a few weeks ago, and I think that was sort of the same, uh, same thing that came up. So I think that's a very fair um, assessment, you know, and something that I wonder in retrospect. So let's see what you did. Yeah, you want to move on, Stephen? Sure. Okay, so I know I gave it away a little bit. But uh, this was the, the final construct that we came up with. Uh, Dome Lamy's at C1 and 7 and uh, a 1 2 fusion with a C2 rototomy and a laminectomy at 2 3 and a 4 to 6 laminoplasty. So it's a nice intraoperative photo kind of demonstrating uh, that technique. I'd say she's decompressed. <laughs> No, cord looks good. Yeah. yeah. So um, here's a uh, post-operative MRI. Uh, she's doing well. Um, she does have improved hand sensation and improved balance. She did develop a, a C5 palsy, but uh, was improving at her most recent follow-up. Yeah, okay. so... I think um, it's the, maybe I'll let you finish. You were going to show some slides there, Steve. I'll let you finish up. Sorry. Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, just a very brief teaching slide on the various uh, techniques for C12 fusion. I won't belabor it since I think everyone on the talk is a spine surgeon, but uh, transarticular screws, the harms technique, and then various method for uh, lateral mass screw placement at C1 and uh, C2 fixation. So um, what were you saying, Dr. Sebastian? Well, I think, you know, the C5 palsy thing is always interesting, um, you know, again, especially in retrospect, um, you know, I wonder perhaps if we had done something more limited, maybe she wouldn't have gotten to C5 palsy, maybe there's too much cord drift, although that didn't look that way on the MRI. Uh, to the other panelists, is, you know, any thoughts about C5 palsy, what we could be doing 
maybe to avoid it or, or at least try to minimize our risk. You do foraminotomies at, at C5 on the open side routinely or just kind of see I, what, what it looks like? I, exactly. I sort of look, you know, I get on my pre-op CTs, I'll get um, our radiology team will do oblique cuts to the foramen. So if I see a really tight C5 foramen, then sometimes I will prophylactically <laughs> decompress it. Or if it's uh, in the setting of a fusion, sometimes I'll use those facet shims to indirectly um, open up the foramen. Um, it was on the left side, um, but um, I don't routinely do that. And obviously the open side was on the left side here. So I wonder, again, maybe there was a injury to the nerve during the time of the decompression. Although to be fair, she did wake up. She was fine for about two weeks before she came in with mm-hmm. sort of the, um, you know, deltoid biceps weakness. So pretty delayed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you did um, a nice job. Laminoplasty is such a great operation, especially, you know, in a teaching facility. I think it's wonderful because uh, the pathology is right there. Everybody can kind of see the decompression happening um, and it's technically demanding, you know, for, for both sides of the spine. So, you know, it's just a great operation for accomplishing uh, what you wanted to do there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably underutilized in the States. Um, obviously, this is a, you know, hot topic, uh, especially in light of, you know, the recent um, research that Dr. Gogowal and his team's done. Um, but obviously, you know, I think, like you said, it's a nice technique, um, you know, to have in your toolbox. I think, you know, um, it doesn't take care of every problem we see in the cervical spine, certainly. Um, but, uh, you know, again, just having a big toolbox for all the residents and fellows, and then you can kind of pick and choose where you want to utilize different techniques. You know, Scott and I were just in Korea last week at the uh, ISAS Asia Pacific meeting, and um, a uh, one of the Korean neurosurgeons there showed some cases of intradural and even intraspinal tumor resections over three and four levels that he did with a laminoplasty approach rather than the traditional, you know, uh, big uh, laminectomy and unroofing. And uh, you know, it was beautiful. It was really nice. And then he was able to cover the. Uh, the uh, the dura again with uh, with the lamina, so it's pretty neat application I hadn't seen before for a laminoplasty. So it's got a lot of other uses that we we haven't uh, really addressed. Yeah, no, I think that's really so. Just out of curiosity, was he taking the lamina off? and then putting two plates on no, either side. Yeah, he was doing an open door just like this. And I actually okay. asked him, I said, you know, have you broken the hinge side trying to, you know, get better exposure? And he said, not really. You know, they, he's been able to do it and and get bilateral decompressions and open the door. He said, it just makes his durotomy a little, he cheats over towards the open side. Open um, but once he's in inside, um, it's the same decompression. Yeah, that's, that's super, you know, super impressive. Um, and yeah, again, I think, again, you know, we probably just don't see enough of it. I think there's a lot of reasons. It looks like there's some questions in the panel. Um, someone asked, did you remove the posterior arch of C1? Uh, I did not. So I didn't take the whole arch off. Um, you know, basically that pseudo articulation was kind of on the caudal end of C1. So I just drilled to the top of it. And then, um, you know, you kind of see when it broke through the pulsations of the dura, I actually just kind of pushed it up and then I was able to resect it. Um, and then the question was, was fusion option or fusion bed? Oh, okay. So correct for C12, you know, obviously since we took C2, we couldn't get, um, you know, posterior structural graft. So for this one, I actually tucked BMP into the facets, um, at C12, uh, for the fusion. I routinely take the C2, uh, nerve root if it's sort of in the way, uh, I don't see Dr. Chapman on. I know he feels pretty strongly that we should be preserving it. Um, I don't know if any of the other panelists have strong feelings about this. For me, it seemed to cut down on blood loss and allow me better access to the joint. But I certainly know that um, some people are concerned about occipital neuralgia postoperatively. Oh, there he is. So no question. This is beautifully done. Sorry, I came late. Great uh, case. So, sorry, yeah. I'm still in the OR, obviously, but this looks very nicely done from everything that I've heard. And again, we will not be able to resolve the C1 nerve root, it's like the C2 nerve root saga uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, I would love to have a whole bunch of people with a very simple questionnaire just to go for it. Ultimately, what matters is the safety of the patient. And where it's, especially in the beginning, can play a big role 
is if we need to do for set orthodeses, like at C1, C2, it clearly is easier to get a quality graft in and to be really sure about where you place your lateral mass screw of C1. And uh, if you have, all things being equal, I think it's just fine to take the root off. And um, for myself, I like to not take it off unless I absolutely have to. It's just easier, it's not necessary. And it gets into the joint just as well. And we can do a nice decompression and um, uh, do a nice C1 lateral mass screw through the posterior arch. So, but th this is again safety of the patient and getting a surgical goal is fulfill this, uh, what you've done here and what's the ultimate goal. And preoperative, uh, clear presentation of the uh, posterior occipital area numbness is obviously necessary. But thanks for calling me out on that. <laughs> Not calling you out. Nope. I'm just trying to. You know, again, I think uh, this is also a big debate in our conferences as well. So, you know, certainly a little bit more literature would help support maybe one way or the other. Um, you know, we know Dr. An has, or sorry, uh, Dr. Uh, Rue has a sort of classic paper looking at his series of transected versus non-transected. And then I think um, there's a meta-analysis also out there uh, from Dr. Failing's group. So um, definitely some papers to look at, but, you know, maybe more uh, information to gain there. Um, you want to jump maybe into the next case, Steve? Absolutely. So <clears throat> this is Mo, 54-year-old female. She has neck pain and difficulty with forward gaze, worse at the end of the day. She has some uh, balance problems with walking, but uh, doesn't complain of any upper extremity radiculopathy. She does have a seizure disorder that's controlled off of medication. Depression, anxiety, hypertension, GERD, and osteoporosis. Uh, she's been on denosumab biannually for many years. Uh, on exam, she has kyphotic head posturing, uh, forefinger breast to the chin. She has uh, full strength in her upper extremities with the exception of four to five interosseous and uh, finger flexors, brisk reflexes, and a positive Hoffman. So these are her uh, AP lateral and flexion extension views of the cervical and uh, cervical thoracic spine showing a pretty significant uh, both cervical and uh, cervical thoracic deformity. Right. So here we have uh, standing imaging showing her alignment. Um, again, we have measured uh, C2 to 7 SVA that's uh, positive at nearly 7 centimeters. She has a C2 to C7 angle of 14 degrees kyphosis. Her T1 slope is elevated at 32 degrees, uh, signifying a pretty significant uh, thoracic deformity uh, in addition to her isolated cervical deformity. And uh, just the uh, focal measurement there from uh, seven to five is 40 degrees to help highlight that. Uh, globally, she is pretty well balanced with her SVA at uh, 4.5 centimeters. Her lordosis is 55 and a PI of 70. She also has a uh, thoracolumbar uh, scoliosis uh, that measures 32 degrees. So uh, again, let's see if we can play this. Uh, this is interesting. It just shows that she has some uh, unsegmented uh, bar vertebrae there in her thoracic spine. And uh, an MRI uh, showing some subaxial stenosis. It's not crazy. Uh, her predominant complaint is um, the neck pain and lack of forward gaze. So uh, without giving it away, um, love to hear the thoughts of some of the, the panelists. Um, our diagnosis is a dropped head deformity with both a cervical and cervical thoracic kyphosis. Also has an adult lumbar degenerative scoliosis and some findings of myelopathy. I think uh, we had uh, Dr. Nasser now able to join on. Um, Akbed, what are your thoughts on a patient with a high T1 slope and this cervical deformity, which is her primary complaint, uh, but uh, obviously a sort of an adult scoli below that? You know, it's a, it's a challenging problem. And uh, obviously, we're, we're all seeing a lot more of this. And um, I think you know, a lot of the times, if you if you really ask the patient uh, where where the pain is, 
in, in a lot of these patients, they, they point to the upper upper cervical spine. And um, if you if you look at, at this lady, uh, you can see that she's hyperextending at her occipital cervical uh, uh, spine, and, and she's really trying very hard to look up uh, through hyperextension between uh, occiput to C1 and, and C1 and C2. You can almost see that her occiput and C2 are touching. Um, and so she's compensating for this, but it, it takes a lot of effort to do that. And so if she if she's doing that and she's if she's compensating, she, she is able to look forward, but it just takes a lot of effort. Um, but the deformity is being driven by this kind of big thoracic kyphosis in her her osteopenia and kind of, you know, her probably sarcopenia. And so the challenge is, I think, for a lot of us, where to stop, right? Because uh, she's got this deformity down low and, and you see this apex of her thoracic kyphosis kind of in her mid thoracic spine. And, and you say, boy, she's got this flat cervical spine too. So I'd love to correct her cervical deformity and be able to give her more cervical lordosis, but I know that I'm not going to be able to stop kind of at my typical T1 or T2 stopping point because she's got her high T1 slope indicative of a, a, a thoracic deformity below this. So I think then the challenge is, you know, there's, there's not a great stopping point, right? So uh, what's, what's enough? Uh, because we, we want good distal fixation, but you know, there, there is no great stopping point short of the pelvis, uh, but you don't, you don't want to do a C2 to the pelvis on every one of these patients. And so uh, I think that's the challenge is, is uh, the pelvis always looks like an attractive stopping point, but that's not realistic. So I, I don't know. Uh, I think all of us as, as, as probably all of our panelists probably have the same challenges. We want to do something small, uh, but we all know that that something small probably predictably fails in a lot of these patients, especially when we're trying to, uh, you know, restore alignment um, and, we're probably also dealing with relatively bad bone here. So, um, but I'd love, I'd love to hear what the other panelists think here. And, uh, and I think you have to probably also keep in, in, in mind how, how bad is she struggling? And obviously, you know, this patient and she, I'm assuming uh, she was your patient. So, um, you know, you get to know these patients over time. You probably don't operate on them the first time you meet them. So, you know, how bad are they struggling? Because if, if this is somebody that's compensating pretty well, maybe this is somebody that you meet several times in clinic before you actually offer them surgery uh, to really get, get a sense of whether or not they would tolerate uh, a large operation. Um, but, uh, but I'd love to hear what others uh, think. Dr. Chapman, I think brought up uh, a couple of good points. Um, you know, one about willing to get a PEG or feeding tube. I think that's really uh, an important point uh, in any, especially these older, you know, cervical kyphosis patients, um, you know, discussing the fact that they may have really impaired swallowing postoperatively. Um, any other thoughts, Jens, from a technical standpoint or what's your thoughts looking at this case? Um, so one thing I like on a physical exam thing is the recumbent test. So having a patient lay in clinic flat on their back, I put my hand under their head, they have to have their hips uh, straight, their knees down. And then I want to see how they can kind of compensate because Ahmed and I always uh, agree to a pernicious degree. Uh, this is a upper thoracic kyphosis problem. And I don't know what her story is and how this happened, uh, but poor bone quality, poor muscle quality, sarcopenia, depression, uh, myopathy, alcohol history, radiation, uh, uh, yet undiagnosed uh, neurodegenerative disorder. Those are all the things that go through my mind. But there's a big difference if she's flexible and if that occiput easily comes down because she can relax the upper thoracic spine. If that thoracic kyphosis is pretty rigid, those are a bear to straighten out in osteoporotic patients. And I would literally start thinking about damage control and just a very limited goals, but a true dropped head syndrome uh, with the chin going towards the chest, that's a big fusion. That's a C2 uh, to wherever, L1 fusion with multiple osteotomies. And uh, it's not a foregone conclusion that this does not end up in the pelvis. So, but that's my, my pitch for the recumbent test, uh, just laying them flat on their back and seeing how far they can go. And the other litmus test in an elderly emaciated patient is, are you willing to consider a PEG tube preoperatively to tank you up to look at your albumin above 3.5 as a screening test? So this is 
this is a big deal for me. Otherwise, we should not pursue this price surgical. We can a make much more damage than good. Yeah, I think I think those are all good points. I actually um, had this patient talk to a few patients who have had similar surgeries, which is a nice uh, thing sometimes to do when you you know had a couple of these cases under your belt, just to get a sense of you know kind of what a big deal it is. Um, you know, I've had at least two patients who have had peg tubes for you know, at least a month or two before they're able to start swallowing again. So talking about that, um, sometimes we sort of forget that, you know, it's good for patients to hear from other patients to kind of get a sense of the experience and understand the magnitude of, of the procedure and what they're going through. Dr. Moore had a nice comment, uh, uh, you know, to make sure that the patient is not maybe on a statin as that that could, you know, possibly cause a myopathy as well. And, and I think we've all seen you know, the complications of, of statins potentially, as well as other medications. Uh, so, you know, just, I would say even medication complications in general, um, and, uh, you know, just making sure that we're not uh, seeing medication complications as well. So. And then uh, it, just real quick, Dr. Dekatowski also brought up a point, you know, um, HIPAA issues when connecting patients. So, um, you know, as a rule, you know, I always you know, say, I'm going to talk to the patient first, see if they're okay talking to you. Um, and so I usually um, give one of our patients a call, make sure that they're comfortable talking with the patient and then connect the two of them. But yeah, certainly, you know, um, I would not refer a patient directly until I've spoken with them first. No, I think that's a very good point. We, we, we have that situation a lot at TBI and we have you know, a list of patients that say that they are willing to talk to other patients about whatever specific diagnosis it is. So one thing that, and this may be a digression, but, you know, you see a lot of our colleagues putting patient stories on social media, and those require like very specific type of releases to do that, not just like, here's a case, it's not identified. Even if it's not identified, you need a HIPAA release from that patient because if a patient recognizes themselves on your social media, that's a big deal. Yeah. And yeah. Dr. Uh, Sebastian or, or uh, Blumenthal or Chapman, um, I know there's some discussion of uh, flexibility of the thoracic curve. So I have the um, sagittal CT of the thoracic spine here to kind of help uh, approximate that. Then my question is, uh, given she has this sort of congenital um, component to it with these unsegmented bar, does that affect your decision making if you're going to consider osteotomies in the spine uh, or, or correcting that sort of proximal thoracic curve? I mean, to me, this looks less congenital. I may, I don't have the whole scene. This looks like a upper uh, thoracic Sherman's to me, you know? Um, there's an active inflammatory disease process going on in the anterior apophyseal ring. At, at least two of those segments and the others look like there's an ankylosis process going on. So this looks like an inflammatory disease process uh, mm -hmm. and whatever Sherman's is, but this is like this osteochondritis um, phenomenon of the disc space that leads to this collapse. So this is, this is a problem. And again, intrathoracic osteotomies uh, in the thoracic spine, especially the upper thoracic spine are not an easy procedure. And you know, the other thing is you don't need to hit a home run here um, you know, probably a, a semi-correction um, is going to make this woman feel a lot better. Uh, you may not make your your angles line up the way you want on your post-op EOS, but, um, you know, just realistically, any relief you're going to give this person towards letting her go back to a more neutral gaze without yanking on her uh, proximal occipital cervical musculature is probably going to enhance her life a lot more than threatening it with uh, a major thoracic osteotomy. That's just from the degenerative guy here. <laughs> no, I like, I like, I like those points. And, and maybe Steven want to jump into what we did. Yeah. So uh, this is stage procedure. Uh, first stage was multi-level ACDF uh, three to T1 with the C4 for anatomies. And the second stage was a, a C2 to T9 fusion. So these are her uh, first standing x-rays. And then uh, her most recent follow-up at one year, 
shows uh, some some worsening of her coronal balance off to the left side. Uh, not a ton, but definitely by a centimeter or so. Uh, overall, she's happy. Um, she's uh, very pleased with her forward gaze, no cervical complaints, and some uh, mild back pain and lower extremity complaints that uh, don't seem to be bothering her enough to uh, warrant surgery at the moment. So, you know, to the point that was just made, you know, we kind of elected here just to address the forward gaze issue, get her head up straight and understanding that with a fixed sort of thoracic kyphos or short of a three column osteotomy, I don't think um, we would have been able to correct that. So, uh, so, so since, since it's the beginning of the kind of the fellowship year and maybe we can just ask that question. So do you think this could have been all done posteriorly, number one? And obviously the answer is not because you did a bunch of anteriors, load sharing. And then um, from a, a screw placement, what was, what did you use navigation and what type of navigation? Did you use a robot? Did you use stealth? What did you use as your navigation? If you use navigation. Uh, so, so we didn't use navigation for this case. Um, uh, did this with one of our, you know, excellent chief residents who now since graduated. But um, no, we did this uh, freehand. Um, you know, I used fluoro obviously to check things, but um, uh, this was done freehand. Um, but you know, if if I was going to navigate it, uh, I'd probably just use uh, ORM and stealth. I, I don't. Have a lot of experience, uh, or, or you know, I'm not as experienced uh, with the robot. And if, uh, but I'd be cur curious to hear, um, you know, maybe some of the other panelists and, and what their approach might be. Any thoughts, uh, Ahmed, on this? Uh, would you have done something differently in terms of uh, trying to address her her thoracic deformity there? You know, I uh, I tend. Uh, on these to probably be a little bit more aggressive. Uh, however, I don't know that I'm right. Um, and, and I think I get myself into a little bit more trouble. Uh, but I, I, I definitely think that I'm going to talk about the positives first. The positives, I think this is really awesome. If you look at the image on the, the, the two images on the right, and this is where I think she's really happy, right? So if you look at the occiput and C2 and C1, and you look at the distance between her occiput and C2, you know, she's got an inch now of distance between her occiput and C2. And this is why she's happy, right? You know, her energy of expenditure in terms of how much effort she's putting into holding her head up has gone way down, right? So she's no longer extending through her upper cervical spine. And this is why she's happy, right? And so uh, you see her SVA has gone down. You, you see the restoration of cervical lordosis. Um, and so this is really why her deformity uh, has been addressed. And so uh, you, you essentially effectively treated her cervical deformity. I don't think her thoracic deformity is any worse. Uh, and what we're all left to wonder now is, you know, are we going to end up with a DJK, right? Um, and so the, the data would suggest that if we stop close to the thoracic apex uh, that we are likely going to get a DJK. And so one of the questions is Dr. Dekatowski asking, you know, why stop close to that thoracic apex? I know exactly why you stopped there because you didn't want to get into the thoracic, uh, the thoracolumbar scoliosis. Because at that point, now you're committed into a much larger operation because then where do you stop, right? Uh, and, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to stop where you stopped, but once you start kind of going into no man's land at the thoracolumbar junction, now are you committed to pelvis, right? Uh, because there's not really another great stopping point. Maybe you could say L1 or L2, uh, but that, at that point, you're starting to get into maybe her lateral listesis and her lumbar spine. Um, and so it becomes a slippery slope, um, if, if she didn't have the lumbar scoli, though, and you just looked at her sagittal profile, I think I would be tempted to stop at maybe around L2 or L3 uh, in her or possibly uh, T10. Uh, I think if you look at that gravity line, it almost looks like that's a natural spot where her head would kind of line up over kind of that, uh, that gravity line in the center. And maybe it would be a little bit less likely to fail over time. Uh, 
Um, I don't know if that's right or wrong. And I don't think the extra effort of doing that is all that much more morbid. Um, so uh, making that incision a little bit longer, and I don't necessarily put screws at every level, so I can justify maybe the extra length of incision by just alternating screws and, and putting less screw density. Um, so I try to make the surgical time, you know, a little bit less that way. So again, just, just my thoughts on it. Um, I think this still, still looks beautiful and I think you did a great job and she's obviously a happy lady right now. And to be honest, I don't know that one set of complications is all, all that much worse than the other, uh, because with a longer construct, now you're trading off, is she going to heal that longer surgery, uh, which is a very different, uh, type of uh, problem as well, uh, because you know, you're, you're putting a much bigger burden on this older lady as well, so. Yeah, all good points. I think um, one of the reasons we wanted to present it, because it's kind of a, you know, I, I think we maybe stopped short of making the angles perfect, as was alluded to earlier, but um, I think at least for her at a year, she seems to be doing okay. Um, in the interest of time, just to keep things moving, I'm going to have uh, uh, Dr. Lindsay step up. And uh, thanks, uh, Stephen. Um, Matt Lindsay is one of our other fellows, um, and he's going to present uh, our next two cases. All right. Can everybody hear me and see my presentation? Yes. Great. Hi, I'm Matt Lindsay. I'm the other fellow at the Mayo Clinic, and we're going to talk about a couple of cases. Oh, let's see. Why don't I stop doing that? Back there. Can everyone still hear me? Yep, you're good, Matt. Go ahead. Thanks. All right. So this case started out uh, <clears throat> with a 49 year old male. He had neck pain. Uh, he presented originally for esophageal stenting. He had stenosis due to a squamous cell carcinoma found of his right tonsil. Um, he had radical tonsillectomy, and he had multiple procedures to his esophagus, um, including laryngoscopies and stenting, um, stent changes, and other issues. He originally presented for first orthopedic uh, exam with a normal reported exam. These were his images as we look at the progression over time. January, May, and he's already getting a stent at that point. And then later on in May, starting to have osteomyelitis near the position of his stenting. At that time when his exam was normal, the decision was made to consider a non-operative treatment for this patient. Unfortunately, after he was treated with uh, daptomycin, he failed. And now he presented to our facility with ongoing Strider. And I just put that up to remember how much, how many prior procedures he'd had. So this is his presentation to our facility. We see a CT scan, he's already got a trach, and we see a change in his alignment um, at the point where he had osteomyelitis before. These are his new MRIs. And we see a worsening of a fluid collection in addition to worsening on his stenosis and his alignment. Rather than belabor those, I'll pick some representative cuts going forward. So at the C6-7 interval, he has an evolving epidural abscess, and he also has um, worsening stenosis. And now at this time, he has severe weakness, including biceps, triceps, and hand intrinsics. It's a little bit worse on his left than his right and starting to have iliopsoas weakness bilaterally. You know, we had a treatment conundrum because this patient had multiple treatments up to his neck and an anterior dissection would be difficult. So we weighed uh, the treatment goals for this, this patient. We talked about what approach to use, what, what potential timing, and who else might be available to help us with um, with possible dissection of his anterior uh, of his anterior neck. As we talked, uh, we wanted to go anterior for source, source control, posterior for correction. We 
we talked to infectious disease and ENT, and we elected for a staged approach so that the ENT team could help us out with, um, with a pectoralis flap for this patient. First stage was posterior, and we did a decompression infusion. And this were his first postoperative radiographs. You can see that we have not taken out any of the anterior portion yet. As we proceeded to stage two, we had our, our ENT colleagues help us out. What they found was this stent that had eroded completely through the esophagus, and their dissection was extremely difficult. I just verified with their op note, and they did ask for a modifier 22 because the dissection took five hours longer than anticipated. Although they were able to finish, what we did was a um, was a corpectomy and replaced it with a tricortical press bone graft, and these are the postoperative images. A few months later, we got an MRI showing that we had good preserved decompression for this patient, and at his one-year follow-up, he seemed to be doing very well. But now he presents, actually this last week, with his um, ongoing issue, which is likely osteomyelitis, and his, you can see his tricortical graft, while it once was at some point healed, is now starting to wear away. And this is the point where we can get some feedback from all the panelists who are out there. Dr. Nasser, very uh, challenging case. Um, one of the uh, questions that's come up in the chat was, um, was it autologous graft that you used or allograft? And what was maybe your rationale uh, uh, there? Yeah, so this is a autologous iliac crest autograft. Uh, so harvested from the patient uh, prior to opening the neck so that we wouldn't contaminate the iliac crest donor site. So uh, typically, you know, this is a radiated uh, field and uh, we, for whatever it's worth, do a lot of these cases with our ENT colleagues. Uh, they've got a fairly busy uh, oncology practice. So they see a lot of uh, patients that have had uh, previous uh, tumors resected, uh, post-radiated beds. And so unfortunately they also see a lot of uh, kind of hostile necks. And so we, we take a lot of uh, free fibulas and a, a lot of uh, iliac crest uh, autographed uh, tissue for reconstruction. Uh, this guy uh, is a young guy and uh, typically what we would do in a case like this is divert the esophagus. So we generally want to uh, do what we call a spit fistula, uh, which is essentially try to divert any saliva from going down the esophagus. And so that way we decrease the bacterial load uh, going into the area of the repair. Uh, and that's what we wanted to do in him. Uh, he's very young, he feels very jaded. Uh, he only chewed tobacco uh, very briefly in his life and they don't feel that that was actually related to his cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Uh, so actually, he got his cancer uh, well before his tobacco chewing years. So um, therefore, uh, he, he really felt like he did not want to go through a spit fistula. Uh, so he wanted to preserve his ability to swallow naturally. And uh, he did not allow us uh, to divert his spit. Um, and uh, it took uh, almost eight hours for them to inset just a peck flap on this guy. They injured uh, arteries on both sides of his neck. And this is actually one of our unbelievably good ENT colleagues uh, that did this case. So having said that, um, the ENT colleagues' words to me were, I will never go back inside this guy's neck. So whatever it is that we're going to do, this has to be a definitive procedure. Uh, or again, uh, this guy's, you know, you know, out of luck. I'm not coming, I'm not coming back inside this guy's neck. So, um, so I, I'd be interested again, uh, if anybody would have done something different and, uh, now seeing this graft erode away, he's actually got a pretty solid posterior fusion. So I don't think Matt has uh, shown the pictures, but we've got, uh, iliac crest bone in the back. We've got iliac crest bone in the front. 
and he's actually healed very solidly his posterior columns. And actually, even anteriorly, lateral to these pictures, he's actually healed his corpectomy graft to both sides. And prior to eroding away in the middle, he had actually fused this graft. So now he's eroding away and presumably with multiple organisms. So he was growing candida, multiple strep and staph species from the cultures that we had uh, taken at the time of surgery. Uh, so all the oral flora that you would expect. Um, so not a great way of suppressing this indefinitely. Uh, but we did get down to healthy bleeding bone at the time of the decompression. So, uh, but this is autogenous graft. Uh, so now this guy has got uh, fairly low inflammatory markers. Uh, he's on oral antibiotic suppression. He's had one year of, uh, uh, of treatment with IV antibiotics. He's still, uh, sorry, one year of treatment uh, with antibiotics, uh, uh, an appropriate six weeks of IV followed by oral suppression. Um, what would anybody do at this point? So he's still on oral suppression. Would anybody take him off at this point, uh, knowing that this thing is resorbing away? Would you keep him on lifelong suppression despite the fact that it's, uh, uh, you know, getting uh, eroded away? Uh, I think at some point, this is probably going to break through his fusion mass uh, and break through his rods is my suspicion. Um, and he's, he's young enough where that's probably going to happen. So I'd, uh, I'd love to hear uh, from anybody that's had to deal with this. So. I'll, I'll take a stab at this. So this is um, obviously stating the very obvious here, an extremely challenging, but very humbling case. And it was beautifully done. <laughs> I've had an esophageal. Even one question is what's in his uh, place of his esophagus now? Is there a, uh, a stomach pull up, a colon, and a position graft. What's in there actually? So How actually, uh, yeah, they they used, um, I think, uh, so they actually essentially did a uh, um, a primary uh, repair. They tried to essentially close it down as much as they could. And then they used the pec flap to close down that tissue. So they, they weren't trying to, um, they weren't trying to get a functional repair. They were trying to get it pretty tight. Um, and um, they, yeah. they, they could not uh, pull up any meaningful tissue. Everything was pretty scarred in there. They could not get any, they could not get a lumen uh, to, to pull into that area. So, um, and they, and you know, so essentially we don't have a, a functional repair. Okay. So, um, yeah. so is he getting his nutrition through a peg tube then right now? So yeah. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 100%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 100% is coming through a peg and, uh, he actually had a peg prior to the surgery. And so he, he's mm -hmm. been getting nutrition long-term through a peg. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you, you nailed it on the head with the, uh, the spit fistula. I mean, there's no way that he would uh, be able to exist in this kind of a desperate situation without a spit fistula. The only other thing, and I'm not an ENT surgeon stating the obvious here, would be to do a pull through either a pre-vascularized interposition graft, which they clearly would not want to do, or a, a pull through, which apparently was attempted and it's not done. But again, I'm outside of my specialty, but that's... Uh, an end-to-end -end anastomosis in this care was bound to fail, I have to say. Um, so he, without a spit fistula, uh, I don't know enough how they can try to do an internal um, uh, deviation, but that's that's the end of the story there. From my end, the only thing I would offer there is if he truly has a posterior effusion, I would debris the anterior part very well. And I've actually done that before and put an antibiotic uh, lace strut graft in there. And... Um, uh, simply have a prosthetic kind of a antibiotically active graft. They would not try to do a titanium cage, certainly not a P cage, and uh, probably also not a fibula graft because this floor on there is in a hostile state. But again, he is he is done for if uh, he can't either have a pull through in a position graft or would accept a uh, permanent spit fistula. Yeah. Well, I think excellent points. You know, I, I think technically it may not actually be possible to get back in. Uh, but if, if, if we 
have the opportunity to get back in for some reason if, if our if our hand gets forced and there are ENT reasons to be in his neck again or his neurologic state deteriorates to the point where I think we're in his neck, uh, you know, for forcible, I mean, for, you know, uh, for necessary reasons, I think we, we would take advantage of that opportunity uh, to get in. Um, I suspect that on the way in, he may have uh, life-threatening injuries uh, to his uh, vasculature as well. Uh, I think on the way in, again, and this is, again, these are guys that are so good at getting us exposure. They, they in radiated fields that I've, I've really struggled to see what I'm looking at. They cut down so fast and get us down as fast. I mean, I've seen them expose a spine in, in, you know, five minutes where I would be there for hours. Uh, and you know, this, this exposure took, you know, hours and hours and hours. Uh, I mean, and leaders of blood loss. Um, so I, when I say this is socked in, this is like concrete, like this is, um, uh, and this guy had an emergent airway, um, and lost his airway and had to be traked emergently. Um, I, I think this is a fairly unique neck in that I couldn't move any of the structures in the front of his neck a millimeter. Um, like with all of my force, I couldn't move any of the structures in his neck a millimeter. Um, so uh, it was truly like concrete, uh, something I haven't experienced before. Um, so, um, so yeah, like retractors did not work in this guy's neck. So, uh, so I, I was actually working in a window that was provided to me by ENT that was like a centimeter by a centimeter window. Um, and I was actually working through his esophagus to do the corpectomy. So, um, so I was working through the back wall of his esophagus to do the corpectomy. So, uh, it, it was a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty, uh, disorienting kind of, uh, position. So again, I think, uh, the challenge again here, I, I think is again, if anybody else, uh, has thoughts, uh, would you, would you wait until there was a neurologic reason or would you try to electively go back in Jens to try to put that spacer in? So having lived through something like that myself in the not too distant past, um, uh, I actually went back in and I put a fibula on. We should show her at a future time. And uh, she just yeah. came to her. She came okay. back for her one year follow up and she actually had healed a, a long fibula allograft. And we had only one pec graft. I put a pec graft ahead, or ENT people, I should say, put a pec graft between that and her compromised esophagus. <laughs> And then work with a bit of a spit fistula. And those usually uh, spontaneously close up after about half a year or so. If there's any distal passage, if there's none, then obviously it should not clean up or close up. But um, this patient is obviously very directive in his care, and I think maybe uh, a palliative care consult might be might be necessary in this regard. Well, would you? We took a lot of time on this one, but uh, it's a great case, and maybe we should uh, we should uh, um, uh, wrap it up. I'll let Dr. Sebastian have the last word on this one. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a challenging case. I'm not sure if there's you know right or wrong answer, but I think you know waiting and seeing how this evolves you know, makes a lot of sense to me for sure. And it sounds like it was tough enough the first time, so it's only going to be harder the next time. Uh, Matt, you think we have time to quickly go through one more? I think when we can run through the next one, I'll just go through the treatment real quick and then we can see the x-rays at the end. Sure. Okay. Case number four, 47 year old male. He was at a uh, motocross race and a tree fell on top of his, fell on top of him. He presented to our um, emergency room with profound def deficits uh, of the lower extremity and the upper extremity. These are representative pictures. And for time's sake, I'm just going to skip to the important uh, images going forward. So he had a C7 spondyloptosis. Um, he had gel facets and, excuse me, his MRI looked like this. Uh, 
Uh, we talked about different approaches and different goals for this patient. Uh, taking to the OR, we we're able to reduce um, from a posterior approach, and you can see from the X-ray that uh, the the C7 body has returned to its place. We did an intraoperative O-arm spin to verify the location, and then a post-op day one CT scan to look for the uh, the location of the of the spondyloptosed um, vertebral body and an MRI also on post day one to verify that the canal had been completely decompressed. And then he is currently with an appropriately healed wound, uh, but I'll leave it on this slide and we can have any comments. So kind of a weird injury. I don't know if uh, somebody would have tackled this differently. You know, my thought was to try to get as much reduction from the back as possible and then only attack the front if I thought it was necessary. I don't know if anybody would have tried to do something from the front first. Jens, you have a lot of uh, trauma experience. Uh, any thoughts or suggestions? Can't beat this. I mean, I think that uh, this is an AO. Do you mind going to the injury films again? You betcha. Soft tissue closure. Uh, but this is an AO type C injury. And what's his neurostatus? What's his Asia level? Asia A at C7. Asia A at C7. Yeah, so this is a life-preserving surgery, and this is a desperate situation, and a long cord decompression and best possible stabilization is appropriate. So um, uh, there's no question. I mean, this is an all-or-nothing situation. And kudos to you and your team that you handled this so decisively. Uh, this is not something for a temporary anterior procedure. So the more cord decompression you have whilst maintaining good cord perfusion at the high maps. Uh, the better. And again, you gave him a definitive surgery. It's, it looks shocking, but this is a shocking injury. And again, the patient um, will benefit from this and he will now probably not need an anterior surgery. Anybody going in from anterior would still have to go posteriorly later on. I'm not sure that this was doable. How long after the injury were you able to get him into the OR and get this reduction done? I, I took him that night. Um, so he came in kind of afternoonish, and I took him that evening straight to the operating room. Um, and he was initially pretty, he didn't have much triceps when he started. He's gotten some root escape and gotten triceps back, which hopefully will help him long term. Um, you know, one thing to be aware, a lot of the hand colleagues now are able to do tendon transfers for some of these, um, you know, uh, uh, upper, sorry, lower cervical spine cord injuries. So talk to your hand surgery colleagues, you know, they're going to um, interface with him at a later date and look at potential hand transfer or tendon transfers to try to give him some grasp back, uh, which will be hopefully really nice. Um, well, I think it's 70 to 59 here in Rochester. Um, so um, again, we don't want to go over time. I'd like to, you know, obviously thank um, the Seattle Science Foundation for having us today, all of the panelists, uh, my partner, Dr. Nasser, and our two fellows, uh, Matt and Steve, for uh, doing a good job putting these cases together. Um, again, thanks for having us. Those were awesome cases and great discussion. Thank you very much. Great job. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, guys. Great job.